Knowing how to invest is an important skill to set you on the road to securing your financial future. Getting started, however, can be overwhelming if you're a beginner. While there's a lot of advice on the likes of TikTok and YouTube, it's something you need to be wary about, as many influencers are paid to promote investment services, or they are simply not financial experts. Taking the DIY investment route is a great option as it's low cost and puts you in charge of your finances. Staying the course and keeping a cool head during negative market events are also key to your success. But how do you begin? Welcome to Pocket Full of Dirhams. I'm Felicity Glover, the personal finance editor at The National. Joining me today is Peter Six, the investment coach at Denmark's Saxo Bank and co-author of Investing for Dummies, who's here to offer his advice on how to begin your investing journey and the pitfalls to watch out for. But before we begin, don't forget to subscribe to Pocket Full of Dirhams on your favorite podcasting app. Welcome to Pocket Full of Dirhams, Peter. Yes, I'm very happy to be here. Thank you. So let's get straight into it. You're an investment coach and the co-author of Investing for Dummies. I'm very impressed by that. What are the common mistakes that you notice that novice investors make? I think there are a couple. And one of them is getting too much concentration in their portfolio, meaning they put all their money on one stock they know and they think it's going to go to the moon and they want to be part of it. So I would say it's also maybe you have to make a choice. Are you going to be an investor or are you going to be a trader? And I think there are three pillars of success in investing. And it is you have to diversify, keep the cost low and do it for the long term. So that is a different ball game than trading for the short term. Eh? Buy something on Monday and sell it maybe on the Friday and try if you can get and uh, make some money with that. I think investing is a is a long term play. And when you look to the to the history of investing, and I think that's why it is so important that especially young people do it, it beats savings. Especially, and I want to emphasize that in the long term. Long term return of stock investing are somewhere between eight and ten percent. Okay, so what are the best ways then, you know, to get started to build your portfolio? Can you outline some steps for us? I, I think there, there are two starting points. And and one of the starting points, especially for younger people, is that they don't have the capital yet to uh, to really say I'm gonna step in with 10k, 50k, 100k, or even more. So they must find a realistic approach to investing. And what I like uh, as a starting strategy that would be dollar cost averaging. And that means that you're going to put on a very regular basis, could be monthly, for example, a certain amount of money, and you're going to invest that in a broad portfolio. And you can think there of ETFs. Eh? ETFs are exchange traded funds. The costs are low and they're very well diversified. You got, for example, you got an ETF that follows the global stock market. So with buying one product, you're invested in the global stock market. And assume you say, all right, I'm going to put in 250 USD from now on every month. I think you achieve a couple of things. First of all, it becomes a no brainer. You don't have to think about it. You just do it. You're in it for the long term. You know that the costs are low and you're very well diversified. The second one is that you don't get greedy or anxious because it is a long-term strategy and you're just going to invest 250 USD each month. Another uh, advantage is that if... And the, the total stock market is at a high point. You can't buy that much for 250 euros. But if the stock market would go down in general, you can buy more for 250 USD. So on average, you will pay a fair price, eh? a little bit less when the market is up and a little bit more when the market is down. So on average, you pay a good price. And I think this is a very realistic approach and also an easy one to do if you want to start investing. And when it comes to starting with investing, I really rely on the pillar of 
that you have to diversify. And as said, the, the, you can reach that or achieve that diversification by buying products that are diversified in itself. And then you probably will end up with ETFs. And they are, at this moment, I would say, the number one product being used by uh, retail investors. And that is not for nothing. And they are low cost and they are very well diversified. And you could also say that the third pillar was the uh, thinking long term. That as an investor and also as a young investor, you have to bring that yourself. And an, a natural question would be, yeah, what is long term then? Is that a year? Is it a three years or five years? I would say the longer, the better. So I'm really thinking of terms like 20 years, 30 years, or, or even more. And in that sense, I think investing should be a part of your financial household uh, for the rest of your life. That was somebody, uh, a, a younger person uh, who didn't have the, the capital yet to invest. A realistic approach would be that uh, you pick an amount which you will invest monthly and, and which you can keep on doing also if you have a little bit of headwind in your life. So pick a realistic number from which you know I will be able to do this for the coming years. Another category would be, all right, I got some savings, but I want to start investing also with a part of my savings. How do I start? I think the product in itself can be the same, can be the ETF, but there is more money. And what you want to avoid is timing the market. And an approach to overcome that is by saying, and I'll just take an example. The amount of savings is 100K. And that person says, I would like to invest 50K. The numbers can be bigger, the numbers can be smaller, but the concept still is the same. So you want to have an investment portfolio of around 50K. What you can do to overcome the problem of timing the market that you say, all right, I'm going to divide the amount of money I've got ready to invest in 12 equal portions. And I'm going to invest in the coming 12 months that amount. You again achieve the same positive advantages. You know what you're going to do. And you also avoid the timing issue. Because in this approach, you would say, the coming 12 months, I'm going to put I have 4K in the market and after 12 months, I will have that portfolio for a fair price over the last 12 months. And I achieved it in a very, I would say, easy and also easy to understand way. That is that That would be the approach for me. And I already mentioned that I make a distinction between investing that should be long term and there might be also some more active parts that you say, oh, yeah, but... I also want to invest like could be NVIDIA, could be Apple, could be another company. I still think that uh, the, the, the foundation of your portfolio or the core of your portfolio should be very, very well diversified. If you want to put on top some more specific choices, and uh, like said, NVIDIA, Apple or Microsoft, uh, you can do it. But you always have to keep in mind that a portfolio must be well diversified and it must be also in balance. And I mean with that, if you got a 50K portfolio and 45K is invested in one stock and 5K is invested in a worldwide equity ETF, I would say that portfolio is not balanced. Because if that one stock goes down, your portfolio will be hurt and the, the well-diversified part of the ETF is just too small to offset the specific bet you took on that one particular stock. And sometimes when I explain the story, people say, yeah, but then it is a little bit boring. And I think at the end of the day that when it comes to investing, that is allowed to be boring because it's a long-term thing. And again, if you look through history, Having a boring portfolio did pay off over the last 150 years. I also understand, especially for younger people, that I also want to have some, now let's call it excitement. And I would call that specific bets or specific choices added to their portfolio. And a good starting point would be make 80% boring and 20%. That's the amount of money 
which you can use for more specific choices and what you expect that will do well in the coming year, five years or decade. Core for me, that is a generic portfolio. You could also say that is the a strategic part of your portfolio and where you make more specific choices, for example, a specific stock or could be even a theme, there you're going to put less money to than to the, the core. And the core is the strategic part and the other part of your portfolio is called the tactical part. And you could also say you divide it investing long-term and a little bit boring and the trading, more excitement, and more specific choices. And for me, investing is a must-do. I think everybody should at least consider investing for the long term. And the trading part, uh, if you feel attracted by it and you do think that you can outperform the average player in the market, uh, you can say, all right, I also want to do some active trading And that is a can-do. So investing is a must-do and trading is a can-do. I totally agree with you on that. And and also, I'm a huge fan of low-cost ETFs as well. I have a balance. I've got most of everything in ETFs, but I do have a fun a fun side, just something that's a little more exciting. And But that's only like five. Yeah, I fully agree. And I think it is very recognizable. And there is an acronym I would like to introduce because it, it explains quite well also the story from a different angle. And that is the, the acronym uh, PPIG. And the first P that stands for preservation. And that is the preservation of your capital. And that might be for the youngsters among us, that, that might not be the case yet. But consider yourself to be 72 and there is some capital, I think the first thing you want to achieve when you start investing is that you preserve the capital you have. The second thing that is interesting, that is income out of your investments. I think there are coupons on on bonds or a dividend. The G, and that is important for younger people, that's the growth. So you got P-I-G. And then, Felicity, you're going to think, oh, what the it was PPIG. Where's the the other P? And that is the, that's the play. And there is there might be also some fun in investing, but again, you have to keep the balance in your overall portfolio. And if the play part is 80, 90 percent of your portfolio, you might go bankrupt. If it's only 10 or 20 percent, you might have a good year, you might have a bad year, but you won't go bankrupt. One question I do have that is related to Gen Z is that a lot of them, like during the pandemic, for example, they all piled into meme stocks, for example. Mm -hmm. To me, that seemed quite risky. I think they're just not listening to those sorts of things and they're following a lot of TikTok advice or watching YouTube videos. And a lot of these people aren't experts or they're being paid to promote various, various products or whatever. What would you say to them if they're tempted by these sorts of things? I think that in a sense, everybody is tempted by making 100% in a week if you would buy a meme stock at the right time. And especially for, for young people, I do see the appeal. I do see the attraction. And I won't say that you should do it, but I really understand if you do it. But what you have to keep in mind is that the overall balance in your financial household or your portfolio is in balance. So if you say, yeah, I'm really into some some very specific stocks and I do want to participate in that because I think they can be multiplied by 10 in the coming five years, I do understand that you're going to put some money there, but not too much. Just do it with a small amount. And we all know the stories of people that went all in can it be also on GameStop? There is a nice movie about it. There were some, some students. They really make lots and lots of money and they keep on buying while it's going up. But those are the good stories. There are also in movements, like in the meme stocks, there are also a lot, a lot of bad stories. People stepping in at the highest point ever mm-hmm. and they really mm-hmm. experiencing a very, mm-hmm. very big loss. So I do get the appeal of 
uh, more excitement or even extreme excitement, but don't put all your money in all your eggs in one basket. I mean, I'd like to talk a little bit about psychology and investing because that's one of your specialties as well. There is a lot of talk about the two and how they're connected. What are your tips on staying calm, for example, during a negative market event or even a black swan? The nasty thing is, if you will be a long-term investor, it is sure that between now and 30 years from now, there will be one or two or three crashes. They will happen. And you can't say, well, so I don't participate yet. I wait for the crash and then I will get in because it might not even happen for the coming seven, eight or uh, 10 years. You, you just don't know. But what you do know, that it will come. And one of the things, and that might be the, the best advice, keep focus on the long term. And that's the only thing that's going to that's gonna help you through it. And also the, the assurance from my side that it, we will experience a downturn again. And it can be 25%, it can be 40%, and it will happen. So be prepared that it will come. And then it is very important that you stay the course And that is the long term. What can also help is that you keep a little bit of cash on the side so that if there is a downturn of 20, 30, 40%, and that you say, I'm going to put some extra money in because it's a very good time to buy now. And the market is down 30, 40%. And and an extreme example was COVID, of course, in 2020. The market lost 35%, and that was in a matter of days. And we haven't seen that speed in a crash, but it also went up very, very quickly. And the people that didn't react, I mean, it turned out to be the best the best strategy. Just do nothing. In the 87 crash, it took around a year to be in the same level again or at the same level again. And then the market went further up. So it will happen. That's for sure. We never know when it will happen, but there might be something, there might be a trigger, and then all of a sudden, everybody wants to go out. Don't go along with the hurt. Stay the course, think long-term, and maybe even increase, if you got some cash uh, on the side, your portfolio a little bit. I think that's excellent advice. Finally, what are your thoughts on 2024? I mean, we're coming towards the end of the year. Is there anything that investors should be aware of? Do any stocks or sectors or ETF themes stand out for you? No, I think it is it is more on the on on the political side what we see happening. Uh, for example, we had just had elections in the Netherlands, and that's where where I'm from. And you see there a move to the right, and I think we can see that in more places uh, on the world. And one of the things that that might have influence is that political shift more to the right. I think it can lead to more fragmentation in the coming year or years, and that might increase the volatility a bit because there will be more countries and it will be more protectionistic than they used to be. So that is one thing. Another thing that, and that's more like a warning, if you look to the the U.S. market. It's been really a very nice plus this year for the for the S&P 500, but it's been carried by only a handful of stocks, and the Magnificent Seven, and their values are stretched. If you look to the other companies of the, the S&P 500, there you see the valuations being much more on, on average over the last decades. So I think 24 can be a volatile year because of the, the shift in politics more or less globally. Yeah, I think you're right, unfortunately. But as long as everybody stays the course and thinks long term, it should be all right then. Yeah, yeah. But as said, we know that we will experience a a crash. And I don't say it's coming in 24, but I mean, I can't exclude it as well. That's being the part of an investor, that sometimes things will happen in the market that you don't like, but they do happen. And then it is really important that you, and I'm going to emphasize that, stay the long course. Thank you this week to Peter Six, the investment coach at Saxo Bank. If you would like advice on your personal finance issues, 
You can write to me at pfatthenationalnews.com. And remember, PF stands for personal finance. Please do subscribe to Pocket Full of Dirhams on your favorite podcasting app to receive updates. And also leave us a review so we know what you think. This episode was produced by Arthur Edison and Dua Farid. And I've been your host, Felicity Glover. <laughs>